أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أحل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Last night we began with the topic of why we commemorate the month of Muharram. And we first started the night by going through the stories of how much the Khulafa, they wanted to stop these commemorations. Just like these commemorations that we are having today, in past times, from the very beginning, there was a push from the Khalifs of how do we stop these mourning ceremonies from taking place. And we went over the story of Mutawakkil that when he was looking around and he was seeing how much love there was in the hearts of the people, he first tried certain methods to stop the mourning ceremonies and when they didn't work, he actually went as far as to demolish the shrine of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, And even when he demolished the shrine and he destroyed even the traces of where the building had been, even then, he wasn't able to remove the love that was in the hearts of the people. And we went over that story of even that individual, the woman that was in his court, whose role was to organize the entertainment sessions of the Khalif. So she would organize people to sing and to dance and to do these different actions. Even she had ended up going on the ziyara of Imam Hussein. Even in modern times, I remember a few years ago, I was in Iraq, we were at the Arba'in walk. And one of the things that they told us, the guests, the hosts that we had, they said that during the time of Saddam, Saddam was very sensitive when people wanted to go on the Arba'in walk because he felt that it was a threat to his rule. And they said that people, they still wanted to do the Arba'in walk. They wanted to walk from Najaf all the way to Karbala. And because they didn't want to be caught by Saddam Hussein's guards, what they would do is that they would walk in the middle of the night. Whenever no one was watching, there was no police, there was no agents, they would do this Arba'in walk and as soon as daylight came, they would then go into the houses of the people that were along the way and they would hide there, they would sleep there. And then when daytime came again, they would rise. So historically, the Khulafa, they have feared these gatherings just like the one that we are at today. And we began this journey of why is it that we commemorate the month of Muharram? The first reason that we gave was the reason that we are mourning the loss of an individual that had so much to teach us. That when you look at a masoom, an individual that is infallible, that is connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have an individual that can change the very world. And so when we have an individual like this that we lose them, then there is a mourning process, there is a loss that for as long as human history goes on, that loss can never be replenished. It can never be fixed. This was the first reason that we went over. The second reason is that we commemorate the love of dunya and what that can do to us. We went over the story of Umar ibn Sa'd, this individual that had a great love for a piece of land that was called the land of Ray. And as a result of that love that he has, this love of dunya, even though he knows, he knows that by killing Imam Hussein, his place is going to be the fire of hell. That love that he has, it pulls him towards the killing of the Imam. Now, when we were going over the story, I hope you caught the lesson in it. That every single individual, every human being, we also create, even if we are not that infatuated with the dunya, we create a certain love within our heart of the dunya. 
And that creates a separation between us and our imam. Today, the question that we should be asking ourselves is, why is it that we are unable to see our imam? Zaman? There is a barrier. There is something which is preventing me from connecting with my imam. And we have to admit that at a level, there is a love of dunya that pulls me in one direction away from my imam. You know, there was a story that I was listening to maybe a few months ago. And it was a story of one of the shuhada in the Iran-Iraq war, one of the individuals that had volunteered and he had fought and he had been martyred. And he says something very interesting. This individual, when I was listening to the story, he said that he didn't have the ability to speak. So he was born without the ability of speaking. And this was maybe in the early 1980s, the mid-1980s in Iran. There wasn't, it wasn't as common that you could go and, for example, learn sign language and you could communicate with someone like that. And he writes in his will, he says that whenever I would try to connect with people, whenever I would try to speak with people, you know, just imagine that you have all of these things that you want to say, you want to communicate. Whenever I would try to communicate with those around me, he says that they would make fun of me. They would mock me. So this was something that was very painful for him. And he narrates after his shahada, he writes in his will, he writes that even though whenever I tried to speak with you, you would mock me, you would make fun of me. He says, know that every single day my imam would speak with me. Every single day my imam would communicate with me. If this individual was able to communicate with his imam, he was able to connect with his imam, then when we are commemorating the story of Karbala, we have to admit that there is something which is blocking us from being able to see and to communicate with our Imam. And in many cases, it is nothing other than the love of dunya. That was reason number two. Reason number three, and inshallah, this is the start of today's lecture. We commemorate and we mourn Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and this is possibly the most important reason. Because when we look at Imam Hussein, we recognize that the Imam is the cause of Islam being saved from complete destruction. If you look at every other religion in the world, you see these deviations, that that religion today, it is nothing like when that religion was first revealed a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years ago. When Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he's about to rise up. He looks at the religion of Islam, he looks at the rulership of Yazid, and he sees that all of those little deviations that had been introduced into the religion from the earliest days, he sees that they are reaching a point where they are about to completely wipe out the religion of Islam. The fact that today we can come and we can commemorate, the fact that today we can open up the Qur'an and it is the same Qur'an with the same interpretation as the time of Rasulullah, the fact that we can pray, we can fast, we can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of these things, it goes back to the sacrifice of Imam Hussein. You know, today you look at the religions of Christianity, you look at the religion of Judaism, it is so altered. You speak to a Christian brother, you say that your belief in God, can you explain it to me? They say that yes, God is three, but he is one. He is one, but he is three. You don't even know what is going on. And they say, okay, well, I'll explain it to you that God is like an egg. It's reached the point where they are trying to make a metaphor of God in relationship with an egg. You look at Judaism, the alterations that have happened within, the idea that a group of people is the chosen ones of God. That God has created all of these human beings on this earth, an ethnic group over the other. These are the deviations and worse that we would have seen in Islam if Imam Hussein alayhi salam had not risen up. You know, a few weeks ago I was looking at a video online and it was a very nice Jewish lady. She was explaining that in their religion they have something just like our hijab. And then she explained that the way that they practice hijab, they have a little bit of a loophole that 
they are supposed to cover their hair, but what they do in order to cover their hair is that they cover their hair with someone else's hair. And so usually that wig is even more luxurious, it's even more beautiful than their own hair, the hair that they themselves have. And so we see all of these deviations, all of these alterations. Islam stands unique amongst all of the religions of the world. And so we owe everything to Imam al Hussein. The fourth reason is that when we commemorate the month of Muharram, we commemorate the sacrifice of Imam Hussein, it allows us to reform ourselves. And I'm sure that all of you have experienced this. That there was something that maybe you were struggling with during the rest of the year. There was some problem that you had with the halal, with the haram. Maybe you were having issues with the hijab, you were having issues with the salah. You were having issues maybe at a line of work where the income was not halal. And you remember the story of Karbala, you connect with Imam Hussein alayhi salam and through that connection, you get the strength to fix that issue that you were dealing with. I don't know how many people, they've been struggling months and months, years and years, they are struggling with an issue and they weep over Imam Hussein after a few tears, they feel that connection, they feel that strength within themselves to stand against whatever they are facing. When you look at the story of Imam Hussein, it is the story of growth. It is the story of change. And I mentioned a few, last night actually, it feels like a few days ago. Last night I mentioned that even in Shia countries, even criminals are reformed by the story of Imam Hussein. That that individual that for his entire life, he is stealing, he's a career criminal, he is drinking, he is using drugs. When the month of Muharram comes, Something changes within him. He says, in honor of Sayyidul Shuhada, I'm going to stay away from this sin. And many times he sticks to it that even after the month has finished, he doesn't go back to that crime and that criminal lifestyle that he had. And so the holy month of Muharram, it is a month of change for us that if you can connect to the story, this is the month that if you are facing any challenges in your life, Utilize the energy, utilize the tear, utilize the sorrow in order to move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was reason number four. Reason number five, and this is such an important one. When we commemorate Karbala, we are reminding ourselves of the failure of the majority to do their duty. And here I want to stop all of us because when we begin to think about Karbala, and I mentioned this yesterday, we oftentimes think about the failure of those people. They failed their imam. But I want to bring us into this picture. That is it possible that we are failing our imam? Because if we don't think about it with this dynamic, then the story of Karbala it doesn't have much use for me and you. When you look during the time of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, one of the things that is clear is that the vast majority of the people of his time, the people of Kufa, the people of Medina, the people of Mecca, the people of the Muslim world, they knew what their duty was towards Abu Abdullah. They knew. But the issue that they had is that in order to help the Imam, it would have entailed loss. And in order to bring this home, I wanted to give you all an example tonight. Imagine that your imam rises tonight. The second night of Muharram, he rises, and for example's sake, we'll make him rise perhaps in the city of Dearborn. He comes and he announces, maybe even in this audience, he announces that, for example, I am Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. These are the proofs. And I am calling upon people to volunteer for my cause. He says, but there is a few issues that I have to tell you about first. Number one, if you want to join my cause, then it is guaranteed that you are going to lose your homes. Just imagine the homes that you have, the comfort those homes bring you, how many years you have worked to pay off the mortgages and to have a home. The Imam says, if you join me tonight, 
you are going to lose your home. So just imagine how that would feel, that after the program, and maybe you would have to stay for the Arabic, and you would have to continue staying because you don't have a home anymore. Imagine how that would feel, that afterwards, I don't have anything to go to. He says, number two, you're going to lose your job. So you can say, wassalam to your job as well. Number three, you are going to lose all of the savings that you have worked so hard all of these years to gain. You're going to lose all of these things. Now, he's not even asking you that you're going to risk your life. He's not saying that. He's simply saying that you're going to have some financial loss. And he promises you that eventually there will be a recompensation and there will be reward in the akhirah as well. But today there is loss. How many of us would be willing to join the imam? And it's a question. Alhamdulillah, I see many hands in the front of the young brothers. Alhamdulillah, this is something that we really have to think about. That if there was this level of loss, would we hesitate? Even a little bit, would we hesitate? Would we say that, you know, I have all of these things I've worked for so many years for. I don't really want to lose all of these things. You know, during the events of Karbala, one of the things that really breaks the heart is that a Rawi has narrated, he says that when the battle of Karbala was taking place, just imagine 30,000 individuals that are surrounding a band of less than 100. He says that when this battle was taking place, I looked, and it appears he was on the side of the enemy. He says, I looked on the foothills of the hills that surrounded the plains of Karbala, and I saw the elders of Kufa. And these elders of Kufa, they had gathered, these individuals that had all of the power, they were tribal leaders. He says they had gathered on the foothills of Kufa. He says, I saw that tears were streaming down their faces until it had soaked their... Would we actually rise up to help them regardless of the tremendous cost? Number five, and inshallah everyone is still with me. Let's recite a loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala... Number six, when we mourn, one of the things that we are reminding ourselves is that Islam is not just a religion that has to do acts of ibadah. And this is one of the clearest of signs when you look at the rise of Imam Hussein, when you look at the reasons why the Imam rises. One of the clearest signs is that if Islam was just a religion, where you go and you do your salah and you do your saum and you go on the hajj pilgrimage and you don't have anything to do with the leaders that are in place and you don't have anything to do with the community, the society. You're disconnected from all of those things. If this was the case, then there is no doubt that Imam Hussein would have remained. And by the way, many people, when they saw that the Imam was about to rise, they had the same idea. They said, look, this has nothing to do with you. We do our salah, we do our saum, we go on the hajj pilgrimage. We do all of the things that we are duty-bound to do in Islam. Leave the khulafa. Allah will deal with them. Imam Hussein's rise, it shows that Islam has a very deep connection with the society around us. You cannot live as a drop of water in the ocean without being assimilated and being washed away by the water. Many times we miss this point. When we look at the Maraja, one of the things that is really interesting, I'm not going to mention the name of this scholar, but he has written a book in relation to the connection between Islam and Islamic governance. In his book, he mentions the following. I wanted to read this to you, inshallah. It's very amazing when you see the connection that Islam has with all of society. He says the following. And by the way, many times we think the opposite of what he says. He says the proportion of the Qur'anic verses concerned with the affairs of society to those concerned with ritual worship is greater than a hundred to one. Usually we think it's the opposite. When you open the pages of the Qur'an, we think that every single verse is in regards to salah and saum and the hajj pilgrimage. This scholar, he says, no, 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 it's actually the opposite. That for every one verse that has to do with salah, 
There are a hundred other verses that have to do with society. They have to do with economics. They have to do with politics. They have to do with how you deal with other human beings. He says, this is the reality of Islam. Then he goes and he explains the books of Ahadith. At least we should say, okay, the books of Ahadith, those are going to be all about fasting and praying and hajj. And again, he says the following. He says that of the approximately 50 sections of the books of Hadith containing all of the laws of Islam, just imagine how many thousands and tens of thousands of hadith are in those books. He says no more than two or three of them are concerned with the ritual acts of worship. Now here, this doesn't mean that the salah and the psalm, these are not important. They are extremely important. But it means that in order for us to establish the true salah, the true fasting, you have to also be concerned with what is happening in the society around you. Then he continues and he says that all of these sections, they are related to the matters of the duties of man towards his creator. And he says then a few more are also concerned with questions of ethics and then all of the rest are concerned with social, economic, legal, and political matters. When you look at the rise of the imam, one of the things that is so clear is that if there is oppression taking place on the face of this earth, if you see Muslims that are being hurt, that are being killed, then you have a duty to stand up. You can't say that this has nothing to do with me. I'm going to go and I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast and Allah is going to deal with that. That's something for Allah. Today, when you look at what is taking place in Philistine, I've seen many people, they say that I'm not willing to say anything. You know, if I say something, I have a nice job, I have a position in the society, I have all of these things that I have worked for year after year after year. If I say something, God forbid I'm going to lose and I'm going to lose everything. Now, we're not asking anyone to be foolish in the way that they approach things. Islam says that you should be measured in the way that you deal with issues. But if you are afraid today to say a simple word about what is happening in Philistine, if I am afraid that if I say something, I'm going to lose this cushy lifestyle, then is it possible that when my imam returns, I'm going to have the same behavior towards my imam? Something very scary when you think about Karbala, and then you bring it to the year 2024, and you ask yourself the question that if I was there in that situation today, and I was asked to sacrifice, would I sacrifice in the cause of my imam? Or would I be just like everyone else that goes with the flow? So this is also a very important... And by the way, there is a tradition, and this tradition, it gets me every time. مَنْ أَسْبَحَ لَا يَحْتَمُّ بِأُمُورِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ فَلَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ That the one who wakes up in the morning, he rises in the morning, and he's not concerned with the affairs of the Muslims. He doesn't really care. He says, Alhamdulillah, I have a nice job, I have a nice house. I don't really care about what is going on with others. Whether in my own community or whether around the world, I just don't care. His heart is empty of that. He's not concerned. Rasulullah, he says that he is not from us. He is not from one of the Muslims. And in essence, Rasulullah says, this individual who doesn't care, he's left the fold of Islam, practically speaking. Inshallah, this is another question. Reason number seven, and inshallah, this will be the final reason for tonight. When we mourn, we remember that the one that connects to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he becomes eternal and he becomes immortal. And the one who connects to the issues of this dunya, no matter how much power he accumulates, no matter what he gains in this world, eventually he finds that his name is completely forgotten. A few days ago, I was looking at an Instagram story. And this brother had gone to do ziyara. Of course, it was a different kind of ziyara. But he had gone to do ziyara in Syria. And he had decided that he wanted to go and he wanted to visit 
the shrine of Muawiyah. So he goes and he says that there was a graveyard where they said that the grave of Muawiyah is found within this area. So he says, I looked up and down, down and up, left and right. I went everywhere trying to find this grave and it seems like no one wanted to tell him. They probably realized that he was Iranian and what he was going to do. That no one was willing to tell me where the grave of Muawiyah was located. He says, eventually, after a lot of difficulty, I realized that there was a certain spot which was the grave of Muawiyah. And he actually was videotaping. He goes up to the grave and he says, I was really surprised that when I went up to the grave, I saw that there was not just one bar of iron. I don't know if you've ever seen in a prison, they have the rows of fencing and iron that prevents people from escaping. He says there was not just one bar, there was three bars and it was so thick that you really couldn't see the inside of the grave. Now, what's interesting is that during the time of Muawiyah, at the height of his power, what does Muawiyah do? He tries to crush the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he does everything in his power. How can I remove the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib from the hearts of the believers? And one of the things that he does, one of the things that he does, he institutes the official cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib during every official prayer throughout the Muslim world. I want you to imagine this. Every Friday prayer that the Muslims would go to for decades, one of the parts and parcels of the religious practices of Salatul Jum'ah, it was to curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. Every Eid prayer that you would go, the Khatib, again, he was duty-bound to curse the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib, to slander the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And this was official policy for 60 or 70 years until it was eventually removed. That should have been enough to remove any trace of love of Amir al-Mu'mineen from the hearts of the people. Many people, they wonder that how in the world, after all of that propaganda, after all of the ahadith that were fabricated, all of the things that are said, how in the world does the name of Ali still remain in the hearts of the people? And then you juxtapose the position of Muawiyah today that his shrine or his grave, they have to protect Muawiyah from the hatred of the Muslims. And by the way, the reason why I had the three levels of bars was that the believers would go and they would throw trash into the grave of Muawiyah. This was one of the practices. So they were trying to prevent, and it becomes such an issue that every couple of days they had to go and clean up the grave. They eventually came to the realization that they have to do something to prevent all the trash from being thrown. Today, you go to the shrine of Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam. Look at how many people are surrounding the grave of Ali. You see, the one who connects to Allah. He becomes immortal, he becomes eternal. His memory cannot be removed. No matter how much human beings, with however much power, however much they try. And we similarly, we look at the story of Yazid and we compare it with the story of Imam al Hussein. During the time, you all know the story that Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he is murdered. He is murdered with all of his companions. His family is taken as captives. They are paraded in humiliation from one Muslim city to another Muslim city. And during that time period, it looked as if Imam Hussein had been completely defeated. Today, I want you to find any trace of Yazid. We don't even know where he's buried. He is such a hated figure that we don't even know where his grave is. And yet, when we look at Imam Hussein, we find that everyone has gathered around and not only have they gathered around the physical shrine, but we see inspiration taking place from the movement of the Imam. The name of Imam Hussein has become eternal. You know, today when you look at every movement that is actually standing with the oppressed people of Palestine, you see that they are the same people who are remembering the name of Imam al Hussein. These were a few reasons, inshallah, I hope that it was of some benefit. I wanted to end tonight's program with a few points just to add on 
And that was that when the month of Muharram arrives, sometimes we don't think too much about it. We just attend the programs and we, we weep and we mourn and we commemorate. I wanted to give a few points of advice, inshallah, on some things which can enhance and allow our ibadah during this month to become next level. The first thing, whenever you see the beginning of the month of Muharram, and this applies to every holy month and every holy time, is that you should always enter the month by doing istighfar. And I don't just mean by saying astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu alayhi, I don't mean by verbally doing istighfar. What I mean by this is that when you enter the month of Muharram, one of the things that we should all do is we should seek forgiveness from Allah from all of our past mistakes, seriously. That we turn towards Allah, we say, Ya Allah, this individual that I am today, I'm not happy with who I am. I'm ashamed of who I am. I've committed mistakes. I haven't done all of the things that you wanted me to do. And so that tawbah, that istighfar that we do, it should be something that comes from the depths of our hearts. That we really ask, Ya Allah, please take all of the mistakes that I have made, fix all of these issues, so that when I enter into the month of Muharram and when I am shedding tears over Aba Abdullah, I am shedding tears with a pure heart, with a heart that is not saddled with sins. This is number one, that our tawbah is something which is very sincere during this month. Number two, and this is such an important thing, is that when we enter into the holy month of Muharram, we should ask ourselves this question, who is it that I want to become? As religious people, we enter into the month of Ramadan, we enter into the month of Muharram with a very vague idea of the person that we want to be when the month ends, when the Ashra ends. And oftentimes when we enter and we have a very fuzzy idea of who we want to become, we end up leaving the month with really nothing changing within us. Yes, we cry and we are affected, but as soon as the month changes, we tend to go back to the same person that we were before the month began. And so it's very important that each and every one of us, we sit down, even take pen and paper, and ask yourself this question, what are my weaknesses? What are my strengths? What are the things that in this ashra, in this month, in this two months, what are the things that I want to see change within myself? And begin to practically map that out, that these are the issues that I have and these are the ways in which I am going to change myself. Oftentimes when we write the practical steps, it really helps us and it really allows us to achieve that end goal. I'll give a very simple example. If someone has an issue with being generous, you know, sometimes we have this problem, being generous, we don't want to give towards the cause of Allah. If we have this issue, one of the ways that we could do it is we could say to ourselves every single day during the Ashra, I'm going to set an amount aside and I'm going to donate that amount in the way of Allah. Whether there's orphanages, whatever it may be, I'm going to donate that amount. And so you make it a daily habit, you break it into little bits and pieces that are easier for you to handle. And so it's the same with anything else. If you have, for example, a goal of praying Salatul Layl, I want to really begin to do Salat al-Layl regularly. But it's really hard to wake up and it's difficult and I'm tired at the end of the night. Just tell yourself one thing. I will only do one rakah. Make it very easy for yourself. Don't say I'm going to do all 11 rakahs. Say I'm going to start for the sake of Imam Hussein. I'm going to start with one single rakah. How many minutes is that? It takes one minute. I'm going to take one minute. Out of this 24 hours that Allah has given me, how can we say no to that one minute? We make it difficult upon ourselves to say no to those actions. And so this is very important. Map out what you want to do, what you want to achieve, who you want to be, and inshallah, you will achieve that step by step by step. And the third and the final point for tonight is avoid dunya as much as possible. Many of you are going to say, but I'm not involved in haram dunya. And inshallah, that is the case. Alhamdulillah, that is the case. That for the most part, the believers, we don't have issues with, for example, haram income. Right? There's no issue with haram money that is coming our way. But one of the advice 
that the ulama they give, they say that even halal dunya can sometimes take you away from Imam Hussein, it can take you away from Allah. And by that, we all have things that we enjoy doing, we have hobbies, we have things that maybe we love a little bit too much. Even though it's perfectly halal, there's nothing wrong with it. But it's a good habit that at least for these 10 nights, at least for this period of Muharram, we make it a habit where we say, look, for this period, I'm not going to look up any videos on YouTube, I'm not going to research, I'm not going to think about it, I'm going to set that piece of dunya that I love within myself, I'm going to set it aside for the sake of Sayyidu Shahada. And so using these steps, inshallah, we can really achieve a higher level of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during this holy month of Muharram.